All right, so before we move on and study definite integrals and Riemann sums, let me just give you a little aside on the summation notation that we've introduced in the previous video. So I introduced the notation, which was this capital sigma letter. So this means that I'm summing the coefficient ai from i equals m to n. So what it means is that I have this expression am plus am plus 1 plus so on, all the way to an. Now here I'm assuming two things in this notation. First is that m and n are integers, otherwise the summation doesn't make any sense. But also by convention I'm going to assume that m is less or equal than n, so that I can sum in this way. Okay, so let me give you some examples of what this means. For example, if I were to write sum from i equals 2 to 4 of i, what that means is that I'm evaluating this coefficient from 2 to 4 and summing up. So I get first i equals 2, so 2 plus the same thing at i equals 3 plus the same thing at i equals 4. So this is exactly what this expression here means. Okay, now a slightly more complicated example. Suppose I have sum from i equals 4 to 5, something like 5i squared. What do I mean? Well, I want to evaluate these coefficients from i equals 4 to 5. So I get two terms here. First one will be 5 times 4 square plus now the same thing evaluated at i equals 5 so I get 5 times 5 square. This is what this expression here means. Okay so let me now uh, study a few uh, properties of these summations that we will use when we evaluate Riemann sums. So the first property is the fact that we can pull out a constant in front of a summation. Okay so what this means here so c is any constant that does not depend on the index i so we can always rewrite the sum of these terms here as being c times the sum of the ai. Okay, let me prove that. Well, so if I take the left-hand side, so I have the sum from i equals m to n of c ai, what that means is that I have c am plus c am plus 1 plus so on, all the way to c times an. Now, if I look at this expression, I can factor out c. So I get c times now the sum of the a terms, so something like that, all the way to a n. And now what we see is that this expression in bracket is exactly this sum of the a i from m to n. So I have this, this expression is exactly the right-hand side of my property here, so I've proved that this left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side. Now, for example, in the case of Riemann sums, uh, we had somewhere in the definition of our Riemann sums, we had that I equal, we had a sum from i equals 1 to n of delta x times f of x i. Now what we see is delta x does not depend on i at all, so I could rewrite, I could take it out and rewrite the same summation in the following way. Now the two expressions are exactly equal because I'm just factoring out a constant term that appears for each term in the summation. Okay, another property is that if I have a summation of the sum of two terms, this is the same as summing the uh, summations themselves. Now the proof is also rather direct. So if I have the summation of ai plus bi, so what is this? Well, I have first am plus bm plus the same thing for i equals m plus 1 plus blah 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 all the way to i equals n. Now what I can do is just rearrange my terms, bring all the a's together, something like this, and then I have all the b's together. I'm just rewriting the same thing, just bringing the, moving the brackets. And now what I see is that this expression is just the sum of the a's, and this expression is the sum of the bi's, so I've proved that this property is true. Now there's also the same property for differences. Now the proof is just exactly the same. Or oh, in fact, it follows by combining this property with this property here. Okay, great. Now there's a number of sums that we will use a lot uh, in uh, evaluating Riemann sums. So let me just uh, write them down explicitly. I'm not going to prove them because it's a little complicated, but it just gives you an idea of how you could prove them. So the first one we'll use a lot is just the sum from i equals 1 to n of the number 1. So 1 does not depend on i to on i at all, so all I'm doing here is summing 1 plus 1 plus 1, but n times. Well, what do I get? If I add up 1 n times, I'll just get n. 
So whenever you see a sum like that, you get just the number n. Okay, now the sum of integers is a little more complicated. So now here I have the sum from i equals 1 to n of i. So I have 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, so on, all the way up to n. It turns out that this has a nice expression, which is that it is equal to n times n plus 1, sorry, n plus 1 over 2, which is very nice. Now to prove that, well, the easiest way to prove it is to do a proof by induction. Remember, I told you to look up online what a proof by induction is. Well, here's a very good exercise if you want to know how to use induction. Try to prove this statement by induction. Now, if you're interested, you could also relate this to something called binomial coefficients. So I'm not going to say anything more about that for now, but you can look it up online as well if you're interested. This expression is, uh, can be interpreted in terms of binomial coefficients, and that gives some very nice combinatorial properties for this sum of integers here. Okay, now if I had the sum of the square of the integers, well, this also has a, an expression, but it's slightly more complicated. So I get n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1, the whole thing divided by 6. And if I take the sum of the cubes of the integers, I'll get n times n plus 1 over 2 square of this. Now, if you're uh, following, one thing that is quite nice is that this is just the square of this expression. So it then follows that the sum of the cubes of the n first integers should be equal to the square of the sum of the n first integers. If you think about it for a while, that's actually not obvious at all. So it's a very good exercise to try to see or understand why this is true, or prove why the two things, why this should be equal to the square of the sum. Okay, so let me finish this little aside just by give you, giving you an example of how you can use these sums to evaluate the typical type of sums that we'll get in Riemann sums. So if I have, for example, a sum from i equals 1 to n of something like 5 times i over n cube, what is this? Well, let me first just rewrite it a little bit. So I'll get sum from i equals 1 to n of 5 times i cube over n cube. First thing you can notice is that the 5 over n cube term here does not depend on i at all, so I can use the fact that I can pull out constant in front of my sum to rewrite the sum like this. Now you see that I've uh, rewritten my sum uh, where the summation now just is one of the nice sums that we know, so I can replace that by its value. So I'll get 5 over n cubed times n n plus 1 over 2 square, and that gives me a nice expression, closed expression, for this finite sum here. So whenever you have sums like that that appear when you calculate Riemann sums, you want to use these properties and the properties of the previous slide to calculate them explicitly in terms of n.